Sir. Hi, Peter Summer, Capital Intel, Black Business News. How are you? The questions on the market is, um, people are expecting that you may have some antitrust issues coming up with the next administration. Um, you ever heard that? No? No. Because here, all DC, everybody else, FTC, DOJ, I mean, you mainly have a, you know, corner of the market in a lot of these cities. I mean, in DC, they're complaining about the prices and how high it is and... Well, the price is the vast majority of the price goes to the driver, so... I know, but just, so you, you just have Thanks Uber today. and a little bit of Lyft. Thank you. All right, thank you. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you. Taxi drivers, for example, in San Francisco, who are on the Uber platform, 
are making 23, 24% more than taxi drivers don't. So we're really, we want to be essentially powering the entire transportation ecosystem, whether it's transport people or transport of things or powering local companies to essentially have a logistics on demand, logistics function that they can use for however they want to use it. So speaking of taxi drivers making more, you remember talking about this is what people are making, how are they? Um, mm -hmm. Or as a driver for Uber, probably defies the perception that some people have. Yeah, so the average Uber driver in the US, for example, is making $33 per utilized hour when they accept a trip, et cetera. Um, it's very, they can essentially work uh, on their terms however they want to. Now, there is a bell curve, right? There are some drivers who are making 50 bucks an hour, there are some drivers who are making 20 bucks an hour, 15, uh, 15 bucks an hour, depending on where they work, where they work, how they hustle, et cetera. Uh, but it is a very, very flexible platform that's providing a lot of people either uh, full time earnings opportunities or part time earnings opportunities, and we're really proud of it. Okay. Let's talk about the mobility side, get into it. From the time you joined the company, 2015? Uh, seven years ago, a little over seven years ago, okay. yeah. Uh, 17, yeah. 17. So from the time you joined the company to now, from a customer's perspective, making the travel process more seamless, what have been some of the big innovations in that truck? So travel is one of the most popular and significant use cases on our platform. Um, it is uh, the Uber customer tends to be a uh, traveler. Uh, about 15 to 16% of our bookings come from travel occasions. Uh, and what we're now trying to do is really we're focused on uh, travel to the airport, travel from the airport, travel to the hotel, uh, from the hotel. We're now probably, we're getting to be about 10% of all trips to all airports, the top 200 airports in the world. We're getting close to be about 10% of all, of all those trips. Usually we'll capture, but we only capture probably one and a half to two times the legs. You know, you think about it, there are four legs, right? You go to the airport, go to your hotel, and come back. We're only trapped, we're only capturing half of that uh, marketplace, if that. And really we're trying to make kind of the experience much better now. So uh, we uh, now, we go to Uber, you can put in your flight number, and we will recommend for you when you should leave home, and we will offer a reserve trip for you now. About 20% of airport trips are reserve trips where you want to pay for reliability, you don't want to uh, miss that flight. Um, as you go to airports now, the wayfinding to get your Uber is a lot easier. We've invested a lot of money in partnership with the airports to improve the wayfinding uh, as well. Um, reserve essentially recommended times based on what we know about the airport and what we know about traffic at that uh, point, which we know most uh, about. Uh, we introduced Uber now XXL uh, because sometimes XL isn't big enough if you have a family like mine, which is you have four kids. Uh, and they don't, you know, like you got to pop into uh, the Uber as well. So we're really trying to make it easier on every single part of the travel ecosystem. Uh, and obviously we have a lot of partnership with travel companies as well to be able to cross-promote uh, our services to each other. So it's a very, very exciting area. One of the fastest growing areas in the business. When you think of this question, maybe a little unfair, we 10% of all trips to the airport, you had on the hotels, you had on the business traveler that's off the road, yeah. you using the Uber. So the, the travel component of the business is, is how big? It's, it's about, call it, 15% of our business overall. Generally, if you look at us on a quarterly basis, about 250 million people are coming quarterly to the Uber platform one way or the other. Um, we know that about 30 to 40% of them are traveling outside of their home city, right? We know what your home city is, where you are usually, and so we can detect how often you're outside of your home city. It's 30 to 40 percent. So we have a lot of people, 250 million people, 30 to 40 percent of them traveling one way or the other. So one, we want to make that experience much smoother. But then the other thing that we are interested in is how do we integrate into the travel ecosystem so that it's not just the ride to the airport, but that we can help you downstream as well one way or the other. Can we, you know, we have a partnership with Marriott, for example. Can we uh, make the check-in experience, you know, if you're coming from the airport to check into the Marriott, can we connect our systems with APIs into Marriott where we're using your geospatial
spatial uh, data. Let Marion know that Jeff was coming in, this is identity, checking in automatically. Those are the kinds of experiences, these integrated experiences into travel that we're very interested in. And then some of it we're doing ourselves. So for example, in the UK, we, uh, on Uber, you can get, uh, uh, you can get train travel through Uber, uh, through your Uber app. And that's one where we're directly integrating the travel experience into the app. It's delightful. And consumers we use, you know, are buying train tickets in the UK and Uber are coming back more and more and more because it becomes part of that everyday habit. So, you know, we go from, you know, six interactions a month, hopefully to 10 interactions a month, a month and then above that. So for those that hadn't thought about that potential of mm -hmm. this large ecosystem, there was recent news of a potential merger uh, acquisition that <laughs> would um, make that even bigger. It, it made it come to life. I think the term for that is fake news. I think that's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's a common phrase. Uh, so regardless, where do we do? So a lot of this you're going to do on your own. Yeah. A lot of this you're going to do in terms of partnerships with the company like Mary, like you mentioned. Where do mergers and acquisitions fit in your your growth strategy? So I think the vast majority of our growth is going to be organic for us because you know we have done. I did a lot of acquisitions when I was at Expedia. We've done some deals at, at Uber, and the lesson of Uber is that the, the Uber is different in that we have to balance supply and demand in a very very dynamic way. So the you know at, at Expedia, if you compare it to, to a travel company, we want to make sure that we have 150 available in it, 150 hotels available in a particular market. Go out acquire that supply and then push as much demand for that supply as possible. If you look at Uber, first of all, we don't know exactly what our inventory is at any particular point. And so every single time you ask for an Uber ride, we have to um, do a screen of the whole marketplace, understand how many cars are available, are open, or are going to be predicted to be open, how close they're going to be, pick the right driver for you, make the right bid for that driver in order to incentivize that driver to uh, take you from point A to B, or take the food from point A to B. It is in the, the tuning of, of balancing supply and demand every minute of every day in every single city that has different, uh, different patterns to it is, takes an enormous amount of data, takes an enormous, enormous amount of data science, and is a very, very finely tuned machine that is run by, you know, algorithms. And that's the expectation of our traveler is for that delightful end-to-end -end experience, for it to be perfect. As a result of that, going out and buying things and kind of glomming them onto the Uber ecosystem is very difficult. So we tend to be much more focused on, you know, we'll do a partnership with an incredible company like a Marriott as well, but I think most of the growth is going to be organic. All the stuff that I talked about, which is empowering these, um, empowering uh, local stores or expanding the number of, uh, of job types for uh, earners or the advertising business, all of it has been built organically, and I think the vast majority of our growth is going to come from uh, organic growth. It's just, it's just very difficult to buy in, in these hyper, hyper AI driven into machines. You seem to be covering all your bases as well. You mentioned before, not just uh, buses and, and taxis, and subways, and boats. Yeah, you need that boats. And now you're doing that, not just things that move, but things that move electrically, that move uh, in an autonomous fashion, covering all your bases. You've got a partnership with Waymo and Cruise. How does that fit into the, the business strategy? Yeah, so we think ultimately, the, we think mobility is going three ways. It's going to be electric, it'll be shared, and eventually it'll be autonomous. And we're working on, on all three. Autonomous for us is a really, really exciting technology in that uh, we think that, first of all, autonomous drivers, robot drivers, are eventually going to be safer than human drivers. And I think in order for autonomous to really get to mass market, it has to be multiple times uh, more safe than human drivers. Humans in the U.S. usually there are 30,000 uh, road fatalities as a result of mistakes that humans uh, make driving. You know, robots have to be 10x better. 20x uh, better than that in order to get to, to scale. So one is 
we think the roads are going to be safer, which is terrific. And eventually, autonomous is going to make travel more affordable to more people, and it's really going to expand its hand. So that is one of the key ways how we can go from six interactions a month to 10 to 15, where hopefully you ditch your personal uh, vehicle. We're doing it, though, through partnership, in that we now have 14 different uh, partnerships with different autonomous players. Um, we are uh, launching uh, Way with Waymo in Austin and Atlanta this uh, coming year, next year. Uh, we'll have hundreds of vehicles in that market with crews and a bunch of other markets we're launching all around the world. And the key here is we have a platform that will bring the most demand to these autonomous players so that these cars that cost often over $100,000 uh, are utilized at a very high rate. So we think that essentially, just like I want every single safe human driver on the platform, I want every single safe robot driver on the platform as well. And we will, or demand will allow these companies to pay for the cars and the billions of dollars that they put in R&D as well. And for you as a consumer, we're building essentially a dynamic dispatch layer that will decide, Jeff is asking for a ride, should we dispatch a person to him, or is it an autonomous vehicle close by? Um, about 50% of the time people say, no, I want a human driver. 50% of the time they're cool getting a, uh, a robot driver. When they get into these autonomous vehicles, the experience is spectacular. Uh, they rate uh, our robot drivers at uh, the same as they do human drivers as well. So we think autonomous is absolutely happening. It will happen gradually. It has to be safe and we have to prove it without any doubt that it's safe as well. But we think over the next 10 years, we'll kind of get this hybrid switch over to autonomous as a higher and higher percentage of our own fleet to move to the autonomous transportation. This happens a lot in progress and innovation. We hold on to our own old way of doing things, even when they're proven to be less effective. So many customers, I should say 50% don't want to go autonomous. Even when you can really say what you mean by Yes, yes. But how do you win people over with the, with the facts hard enough to do it? I, I think that if, when you use the product, when, when we're doing research now, the product is delightful, and I think word of mouth is going to get there. You know, Uber was built on the word of mouth, like we, the, we did very little advertising. Now our advertising is, is much more focused on kind of the newer products we have teams, etc. But uh, I am not at all worried in terms of consumer uptake. It will absolutely be. So you, you mentioned where things are going. Uh, and electric was the start of that. It's going to be more sustainable. You guys have made big bets in this space. We have. Talk a little bit about that. I think the elephant in the room. Talk about it in this political environment where we seem to be a little bit torn as to where we want to go as a country leading in to electric vehicles. Yeah, I don't think it's necessarily this political environment, which is we had a period where electrification was the absolute future, and I think there was a ton of investment uh, going to electrification. And I'd say over the past two years, we've seen our OEM partners and a lot of different players pull back. We're still determined to drive to electrification. So we've made a, we have a target. By 2030, we want to be all electric in the US, Canada, and Europe. Very difficult to hit based on this environment and based on how things are going. Uh, I think the good news for us is that uh, the Uber driver is switching to uh, EVs seven times faster than the average driver. Uh, and if there's any driver in the world that you want to go electric, it's an Uber driver because they, they drive about four to five times the miles that, are, that a regular driver does. So, you know, the, the electric buying car doesn't help the environment. Actually, not driving an ICE car is what helps the environment. So, you want to get drivers who are driving the most miles, that are Uber drivers, over to uh, EVs as quickly as possible. That said, we need incentives. We are investing uh, 800 million uh, over the next couple of years. We have been investing in terms of higher incentives, economic incentives for our drivers to go electric. We have partnerships with a bunch of different OEMs to secure uh, the cars cheaply because there isn't you know, a great second-hand market in the marketplace. And then the huge issue for us is charging infrastructure. Uh, our drivers need to charge during the day. Sometimes they don't have a garage to charge at home overnight. And the charging infrastructure 
especially in the major cities in which we operate, usually are in the center cities and not necessarily where drivers live. So we're working with local cities and constituents to get charging infrastructure into the neighborhood that our drivers live as well. But I'll tell you, Jeff, it's a slog. Uh, we are very, very determined to keep pushing forward and do our part in terms of electrification. We'll see with a new uh, uh, with a new administration where we go, but we're going to be pretty determined. The last factor is that, uh, or an important factor is that, the the best manufacturers, other than Tesla of EVs, at this point, are many of the Chinese manufacturers. We have a great relationship with BYD, for example, because we want to get these safe, affordable cars for our drivers. So hopefully, we'll be able to continue getting these uh, EVs to our drivers because they are the most important constituency to switch over. You mentioned when it comes to charging infrastructure, working closely with cities and local leaders. Mm. The Uber you inherited, the startup Uber, was known for being very aggressive, uh, perhaps ruthless at times, uh, not developing great relationships at the local level with policymakers and regulators. How has that culture changed under your watch? Well, it's had to change significantly. And, and I will say, you know, early on, Uber was, you know, fighting a bunch of regulation that was trying to keep it essentially out of uh, the innovation game. And, and you know, now, uh, I think some of that aggression, you know, got us to where we are. But when, when I took over, um, what, what I talked to the team was, is that a lot of like, the concerns of the regulators were justified. And that we really had to get in a dialogue with regulators and, and understand what their concerns were. Their concerns were, you know, future work, what did that look like? Safety, what does that look like? Um, environmental and electrification, what does that look like? Congestion in a city, how can we be a part of uh, actually helping congestion in the city? Those are concerns that all of us should have as citizens. And so I think the switch that we made was we went from one of, to some extent, fighting it out in the public sphere uh, with regulators to having a dialogue. And then, you know, we don't agree on everything. But all of those issues, quality, independent uh, work, uh, safety, especially for women drivers and riders on our platform, congestion in cities, electrification, those are all incredibly important to us as well. And we are, I think, leaders now in every single one of those categories. And as a result, uh, the relationship that we have with regulators is much, much improved. Uh, and we will continue to improve. Are there specific destinations? Specific destinations that are case studies in building a great relationship. I think you know London is, uh, it is one, for example, which is I think it was the second week I was on the job. I had to fly to London because the transport from London didn't find us fit and proper for uh, a license. Uh, it it took a while for us to rebuild trust with TFL. There were lessons that we had to learn as well, which was there there was a greater standard for safety and quality that at first we had a very hard time. We just didn't have the operating practices to meet those standards, but we built up those operating practices. And I think a lot of the lessons that we learned from London and TFL, we're now applying all over the world. Um, the UK is now one of our best markets. London is one of the best cities out there on a global basis. The relationship with TFL is a really strong relationship. And I think honestly we learned a lot from, from that group. So, I'd say TFL was great. Mm. Let's close with this. You've got, as in most rooms you go into, you have a room full of customers. What are the two or three things, innovations, changes that we should be most excited about that's coming <coughs> right now in the next one? Well, I, I'd say uh, hopefully a greater percentage of your Ubers will be electric. Uh, we're introducing shared rides. I don't know if this crowd is going to do shared rides here, <laughs> but to the extent that you do, it helps congestion. Helps the environment, helps your pocketbook as well. You know, one that I think is going to be really cool is we're increasingly working with uh, Joby Aviation, which is vertical takeoff and landing uh, vehicles. These are uh, EV electric powered uh, uh, helicopters that usually have eight rotors so that they're incredibly safe, they're incredibly quiet, uh, and you will see Joby's, you know, flying in certain cities uh, around the world and available on the platform over the next three to four years and it's something that we're absolutely thrilled about so that that airport ride yeah. can be 
even smoother, and I can be even quicker as well, which is something that I personally want to control too. We all need to do that. Thank you. Please join me in thanking God.